Well, in case you don't know me, my name is Mark Nelson, and I have the privilege of pastoring our online campus here at Northridge, and I'd love to just say welcome uh, to you, whoever you are, from wherever you're joining us from, whether that's uh, in person at one of our physical campuses or online with us from home or somewhere else in the world. When I was a little boy, my go-to toy was Legos. I loved Legos. I loved imagining what I could design, what I could build with these colorful little plastic blocks. Um, in fact, my parents are here today, and sorry, Mom and Dad, for all the Legos you had to step on in the middle of the night. But uh, Legos were kind of the Minecraft of my era, <laughs> uh, if you're into gaming. Um, we didn't have Minecraft, but we had Legos, and uh, eventually Legos became more sophisticated, not to mention more expensive. And uh, as time went, they, they you know, distributed Legos in prepackaged sets, themes that you could buy, like you could build the Star Wars Millennium Falcon, or you could build uh, the Titanic cruise ship, or whatever you were into, there was something for you. You could buy it pre-packaged as a set, and the way that you sort of began the process of putting this Lego set together, it actually started in the store when you looked at the box on the shelf, and you saw what you could build at home, and you thought, wow, I just can imagine that I can build that at home, and I can't wait to build like that 3D model of that thing. It was like a puzzle that needed to be put together. But without the picture on the box top, like a puzzle, it would have just been an exercise in frustration because you'd have no sense of what it was you were hoping to construct. And I think there's a really important life principle there, and that is when it comes to pretty much anything, we want to begin with the end in mind. Like that's a principle that allows us to focus on what's most important when we begin with the end in mind. We do this in all kinds of areas of our lives. If we set out to do a home repair project, we begin with the end in mind, the completed project, already visualizing what that looks like. If we enter a race, we begin with the end in mind, the finish line. If we start college, we begin it with the end in mind. If we go on a diet, right, we have a vision of what we hope the end looks like. We do this in life. And I think when Paul sets out to write this letter to a bunch of Philippian believers, uh, believers in the city of Philippi, when he does that, he does the same thing. When he sits down to write from the very first word, he begins with the end in mind. He already knows where this is going. He already knows what this whole thing has been about. And we read it. In one of the last verses of the letter, we're going to skip all the way to verse 20 of Philippians chapter 4, where we read, To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so this purpose of a life of joy that we've been learning about through this series, it's really ultimately about that our lives would bring God glory. A life of joy brings God glory. See, joy, this joy we've been learning about, this joy that Paul's been teaching us about, it isn't first and foremost for our benefit, though it does benefit us greatly, but it is ultimately for God's glory, that he'd be glorified through our lives. And what does that mean for God to be glorified through our lives? Well, I think you can think of uh, the word glory like a mirror, that like a mirror that reflects back a true image of whatever's standing in front of it, Scripture says that our lives were made in the image of God, and so when we reflect back to God like a mirror, a true reflection of his character, our lives bring God glory. Nearly 400 years ago, in the year 1647, a group of theologians and scholars met in a room in the Westminster Abbey in London, England, and they drafted a set of documents, among which was the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Shorter because it was meant to be a concise set of Christian beliefs. And many still regard it among the finest summaries of Christian doctrine. And it was laid out in kind of a question and answer format. And the first question, which also happens to be the most popular question still today, was this. What is the chief end of man? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. 
And when the, the catechism uses that word end in the English language, that word can have a couple different meanings. It can mean the conclusion of something like, don't worry, the end of this sermon is soon enough. <laughs> or it can mean uh, a purpose or the purpose of something. And that's really how it's being used here. The writers were asking the question, what is the primary purpose of people? And the answer was to bring glory to God and enjoy him forever. And there's that word joy again. This really reinforces what Paul has been teaching us, that the, the glory of God and a life of joy are inextricably bound together. There's great joy found in glorifying God. You see, when we begin our lives with the end in mind or continue to walk along life's pathway with the end in mind, we, think, uh, we, we can see things with much clearer focus. When we understand why it is we're here on planet Earth, our lives are filled with great meaning and purpose and, yes, joy. And by the way, in case you never got the memo, your life is not always going to go how you plan it. <laughs> like you're going to be disappointed. I'm sorry to have to tell you that. You're going to have your heart broken. You're going to get sick. You're going to lose your wallet. <laughs> you're going to get ripped off, scammed. Your car's check engine light is going to come on again, right? Like, Life is just not going to go the way that you hope it will, but this joy that we have found in the purpose of living a life of glory for God, it's able to rise above all of that stuff. Now remember, this letter was written by a man sitting in a Roman prison under Roman guard. Paul's writing from imprisonment, and as we get here to chapter 4, we sort of get an inside look at Paul's joy despite his circumstances as he interacts with people in his life that were very dear to him. People he remembered from prior days of face-to-face -face ministry. And in contrast to the harsh words that we saw in chapter 3 against the enemies of the cross, here we see some of Paul's warmest words he ever writes. Verse 1, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I love that Paul calls these dear believers, his joy and crown. Because there's nothing more rewarding for a spiritual leader than to see those that you've poured your life into uh, continue to move forward into a life of deeper faith. And don't you know, Northridgers, that that's the same way it is here at this church, that the reward of the spiritual leaders here is that we get to sit on the front lines watching God transform your lives. It's an amazing thing. But in verses 2 and 3, Paul calls out two women, Yodia and Syntyche, great baby names if anyone's planning on having a girl. <laughs> Yodia and Syntyche could, could, could use one of those. And uh, apparently these two women were at odds with each other. They were in conflict of some kind, and Paul calls them to be united. Then he says of both of them in verse 2, and I think this is interesting, he says of both of them, they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. So though these women were in sharp disagreement with one another, yet both were effective partners with Paul in the work of the gospel. And I think this is very significant as we live here in our own divided times to realize that 100% agreement is not necessary for gospel effectiveness. Joy's purpose is bigger than our differences. Aren't you glad today that joy in Christ doesn't demand sameness? And I know I am. Because it's not found in us anyway. It's found somewhere else. Paul tells us where it's found in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. Now we already were told this by Paul in chapter 3. He instructed us on the same command, and rejoice in the Lord. But here he says it a little bit stronger. Rejoice in the Lord always. Always? Always. And in case you missed it the first two times, I'll say it again, rejoice. <laughs> Remember, as we talked about in week one, joy is a choice, right? So we can always choose to rejoice, no matter the circumstance, but it's more than just a choice, it's also a condition. This ever joy, we might call it, that we're being called to, doesn't mean we'll always be happy, and it doesn't require that. But we can always rejoice in the Lord because our joy is not rooted in us or in our circumstances that are always changing, but our joy is rooted in our God who never changes. And that means that joy is a permanent condition of those whose lives are found in God. So this is really a call by Paul to live a life of 
joy. And what does that look like? What does it look like to live a life of joy? Well, through the rest of this chapter and the rest of our time together, I think we're going to see how this joy that we possess affects every single area of our lives. And so I'd like to think about three ways a life of joy glorifies God. Three ways a life of joy glorifies God. In verses 5 to 7, we're going to see what I'll call joy's approach. Number one, joy's approach. Paul describes how those with joy in God approach people and situations. You could kind of call this the experience that others have of us. Because Paul writes in verse 5, let your gentleness be evident to all. Let it be observable, obvious to everyone looking at you, your gentleness. The Lord is near. So the first aspect of our approach is gentleness. And when he says the Lord is near, he might be saying Christ's coming is soon, right? Like uh, you can count on him coming back soon. Or he might be saying uh, his proximity, right? His closeness to you because by his spirit he indwells you. So in either case, the Lord is near. And I think something significant happens, something dynamic happens when we become aware of another's presence. So I remember back when our girls were um, younger, uh, we have four daughters, and uh, as they were little girls, you know, as a parent, if you're a parent, sometimes you'd be frustrated a little bit with, you feel like you've told your kid the same thing over and over, and it's not sinking in. And I might have been at the end of my rope at a certain time and frustrated and spoke to one of them harshly and said, you know, like, I can't believe what it, you know, what you did. Like, you did that again? What were you thinking? I've told you a thousand times. And then I noticed somebody walked in to the room, and immediately my tone changed. And like, now, honey... <laughs> Like, we've talked about this. You know, daddy loves you. Now run along, you know, (laughs) be a good girl. I mean, like, the tone immediately changed because I became aware of someone's presence. And I think that's what Paul is kind of alluding to here is that as we become aware of God's presence, our gentleness should become evident. We should adjust our approach. Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So no matter the circumstance you might be dealing with today, you don't have to freak out. You don't have to be eaten up by anxiety. Instead, Paul says you can use it as an opportunity to be thankfully and prayerfully dependent. Dependence is another aspect of our approach. We don't have to be anxious, but we can realize that God's got us in the middle of whatever it is we're dealing with. Verse 7 He writes, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And we'll have, Paul says, this unexplainable peace, peace that transcends our understanding, where someone watching us in the middle of whatever it is we're dealing with would step back and say, I don't understand. Like, how can they be so calm? I'd have come unglued. It just doesn't make sense to me. Could our approach to people or circumstances be described by these terms, gentle, God-dependent, peaceful? Would others conclude that about you by your interactions with them? You know, I think it's safe to say that we don't always see this kind of approach in our culture today, do we? Um, I have uh, one daughter, our youngest daughter just got a job at Chick-fil-A, good chicken, and (laughs) When, uh, when she was working, uh, I think it was about a week, a week and a half or two weeks ago, she said a guy came in obviously upset, maybe with his order or something, and he walked right up to the counter, and he's like, where's your boss? I'm like, that's your opener? Like, where's your boss? I mean, this is the nicest fast food restaurant on planet Earth. These people say, it's my pleasure to everything, and you can, you can start with, where's your boss? Like, you can't even get a hello if we can't even get a hello out of you so I just I was reminded like our approach that we see in culture it doesn't always of course measure up to what Paul is talking about here but you know if I'm honest sometimes as I scan the pages of social media or observe the interactions of those that name the name of Christ I'm afraid we don't always do a whole lot better and Paul says we should do better when it comes to my approach personally I've had to learn a lot in recent years Uh, on this issue because uh, what I came to realize as I was thinking about this, uh, I became a leader in in church world at a young age. I was 23 when I became a pastor and I looked even younger than that and uh, it was tough to get respect in the room, that kind of thing. So I knew I needed to really grab the horns of leadership and I really needed to drive forward with determination, with passion if I was going to be effective. 
What I came to understand, though, was, was that the thing that allowed me to gain ground in the early years also was developing some patterns of approach that were not the best, that were uh, kind of abrupt, too matter-of-fact. I wasn't taking the time necessary to really consider what the other person was, was feeling about the interaction. I knew what I meant in those situations, but I wasn't sure that, that I was, you know, what the, that they were picking up what I was laying down, if you will. Like, I learned this, that it's not enough, guys, to simply know what we meant. We have to go the extra 10% and consider the perception that we're having in the mind of the person that we're interacting with. Sometimes I think our approach, even as Christians, screams not gentleness, but rudeness. Not God dependence, but dependence on being proved right. Not peace, but worry and anxiety. And so an action step for us today in this is to take a moment just take that extra couple seconds to consider your approach before interacting. You know, a life of joy in Christ demands that we do this, that we push pause and consider our approach before responding to people or circumstances. What if we just took a moment and just, uh, instead of spouting, spouting off, we, we caught ourselves and we just took that extra couple seconds to consider the approach that we're taking before hitting send, what if we just took that extra couple seconds and considered how it would be received? Man, I think a life that's marked by gentleness, obvious God dependence, and peace will bring glory to God in our lives. Paul continues in verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. The second way a life of joy glorifies God is through joy's attention. Number two, joy's attention. This is really what we choose to allow our minds to dwell on. While joy's approach has a lot to do with how we influence others, joy's attention has to do with how we allow ourselves to be influenced by the things that we think about. In his book, Competing Spectacles, author Tony Ranke reminds us that we live in a world where a million voices are battling for our limited attention. And to get it, he suggests that they have to create bigger and bigger what he calls spectacles, things that we just can't keep ourselves from watching. And he writes, behind it all, spectacles want something from us. Consuming is part of it, but we don't merely ingest spectacles. We respond to them. Visual images awaken the motive in our hearts. Images tug the strings of our actions. Images want our celebration, our awe, our affection, our time, and our outrage. Images invoke our consensus, our appeal, our buy-in, our respreading power, and our wallets. So in the midst of all this noise and competition for our attention, Paul's urging us to limit our focus to those things that could be described by the eight words on the list he gave us. True. Noble or respectable, right, pure. He's talking about moral purity there. Lovely, admirable or commendable, you could say. Excellent, praiseworthy or worth celebrating. And certainly this isn't a comprehensive list from Paul. It's not like we should look at the list and go, well, he didn't say good, right? (laughs) No, that's not what he's trying to do here. He's just, he's kind of firing off an array of qualities that represent all good and virtuous things. And what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to emphasize the importance of what we choose to let our minds dwell on, how either beneficial or harmful it could be, depending on the nature of it. So the action step in this area for us is to take some time to evaluate the quality of the things that have your attention. Do those traits that we just looked at from Paul, do they describe the things that you give your attention to, that you focus on? For many of you, they do. I'm thankful to say that that your life of joy in Christ is producing affections within you that drive your attention to the right kind of things. And you're renewing your mind, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12, by reading and meditating on Scripture. And you're filtering out the, the harmful things from what you think about. Keep it up. You're glorifying God in your life in that way. But for others here today, you might have to admit that things aren't going so well for you in this area. If you're honest today, you'd have to say, you know, the media I consume, the movies, the the podcasts, the websites, the books, they don't 
really fall in line with what Paul says are the kind of things we should be focusing our minds on. And, and the reality is, yes, we live in a fallen world, so I don't think we can expect to never come across unhelpful content. But there's a big difference between encountering an occasional vulgarity or unhealthy idea and the consistent enjoyment of content that's actually been produced to celebrate the very opposite of what's on Paul's list. Ta- uh, TV talk shows, for example, that produce and promote gossip, slander, and the spreading of rumors. Websites that are designed to lead into impurity and temptation. Social media threads that are anything but lovely. Music that reinforces a worldview that isn't right, true, or commendable. Comedy routines that might be funny, but aren't respectable. And if we allow our minds to dwell on unhelpful content, I'm afraid we do it to our own detriment. But it isn't, only, it isn't only media content. Some of our most dangerous thoughts come from surrounding ourselves with the wrong people, allowing the wrong kind of people to influence us in negative ways. Or sometimes the most dangerous voices are the ones in our own heads. I have nothing to offer. I'm a loser. I'm just not good enough. I just can't overcome that sin struggle. Statements that are inconsistent with what's true right and noble, ideas that don't reinforce what God says is true of us, which is why I think Paul gives us one more quality related to what we should think about, that which is, he says, consistent with his own life and teaching. In other words, the good things taught in Scripture. And so for all of us, as we actively think about God's truth, that's one way to promote a life of joy, a life that brings glory to God. Well, as Paul concludes his letter, sharing some personal sentiments with the dear friends at at Philippi who meant so much to him. He can't help but to give us a window into the kind of attitude that a person with joy develops. A person with true joy develops an attitude or certain attitudes. Number three, joy's attitude. And I see this attitude expressing itself in three ways in what Paul writes. Verse 10, he writes, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed renewed your concern for me. This is an expression of appreciation from Paul. And so the first attitude is gratitude, gratitude. Apparently these Philippian believers had given Paul a gift of some size, probably monetary. And later on in the chapter, Paul outlined some very specific ways that this church had cared for him. And in grateful response to all these believers had done for him, Paul in turn reminds them of why they should also have a a grateful attitude. In verse 19, he writes, and my God will supply or will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So Paul's saying, essentially, that the same way that, that Philippian believers, you've provided for my needs, you can count on God providing for your needs. So be grateful. The next attitude we see in verses 11 and 12, it goes right along with gratitude. In verse 11, Paul says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. <laughs> you're not? <laughs> like, you're, you're in chains, Paul. How are you not in need? But Paul has a, a different perspective. He says, For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And so the next attitude that displays a life of joy is contentment. In any circumstance, whether hungry or full, whether rich or poor, whether I get the stimulus check or I don't get the stimulus check, whether I get the job or I don't get the job, whether I get the promotion or I don't, whether I get the house or I don't, in any circumstance, I can be content. And you know, the quickest way to become ungrateful and discontent is to look at all you don't have compared to what everybody else has, right? Have you experienced that? But, but Paul is saying here that because of the eternal joy that we have in Christ, that means that we can actually look at all the things that everyone else has and be happy for them without it stealing away our joy Because we have everything we need in Christ. Because God has supplied our every need in him. So the attitudes of gratitude and contentment are reflections of true joy. But there's another one in verse 13. Paul writes, I can do all this through him, that is Christ, who gives me strength. And that's not just a great verse for Tim Tebow's eye black. (laughs) That's a great verse to fill us with hopefulness hopefulness, that because of the strength that Christ provides, we can exist in a state of confident hope. I may not be in a situation right now that seems very hopeless, 
but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. My job may not be an easy place to keep a Christ-like attitude, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. My life might not be working out just the way I pictured it, but that's okay because I know I don't, I don't exist for my own glory, but for God's glory, and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. My recent diagnosis may look bleak, but I'm not going to lose hope because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My marriage may seem irreparable, but I don't live most ultimately for my own momentary happiness, and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And I wonder today, in the midst of your difficult circumstances, whatever they may be, do you still exhibit joy's attitude through gratitude, contentment, and hopefulness? And by the way, how would you know? I don't know that we're always the best at assessing our own attitudes. I know I'm sure not. So this one is one that we might need some help on. So if you dare, I think an attitude, I think an action step today to take on this would be to ask someone close to you whether your attitudes reflect these three character qualities that Paul is mentioning. And ask them to give you honest feedback. Don't let them off easy. Lean into their input and then receive it and seek to grow from what you learn. You know, I mentioned the example uh, earlier of finding hope even within a difficult marriage situation. And I have some friends named Chad and Beth who've been longtime members here at Northridge. And they were actually a part of my wife and my community group like I think about 10 years ago at this point. And I've asked their permission to share part of their story with you. But over many years, Beth had voiced her desperation regarding her marriage. Um, Her husband, Chad, had brought some very unhealthy aspects into the marriage and had not been actively uh, handling his responsibilities within the marriage, been very passive in those things. And when confronted by caring men in his life, Chad was just unmoved. And Beth was at the end of a rope, like, She just didn't know what to do. She really suffered through those years wondering, should she stay in the marriage or just throw in the towel? She just wanted to give up, but didn't want to give up at the same time. She wanted to honor the marriage vows that she had made. She wanted to honor God. She didn't want to give up on hope. Well, I have some amazing news to share with you because just this past spring, Chad surrendered his life to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, God has transformed Chad's heart in ways that only he, of course, can do. And he's, re- he's transforming their marriage. And we're actually going to have the opportunity to celebrate with Chad and Beth in a few weeks as Chad takes the step of baptism here before us. But recently, uh, Beth wrote a note of thanks to some who had walked beside her through the most difficult years. And I thought her words were very worth sharing today. She wrote, I needed help to endure a very painful marriage biblically to suffer patiently, even with no hope of change. I needed to learn to trust God with my life, despite my circumstances. Later on in the note, she celebrates, Chad has a new life. Chad and I have a new marriage. Thank you, Northridge family, for lifting us up all these years. We are proof that there is always hope, even when it appears that all hope is lost. Praise God. That's amazing. And I'm so grateful to see how God has worked in Chad's heart. And I'm so grateful to see how he's honored Beth's perseverance and hopefulness. And you might say today, you know, I'm happy for them too. And that's great for Beth. Her marriage was fixed, but mine's still broken. Or I I still find that I'm in such a, a hopeless situation. How can I know that my situation will improve? Well, the truth is today, you don't. You don't know that you're situation will improve. But I hope what you've discovered throughout this series in Philippians, as we've looked at what it means to truly have joy, no matter what, is that you have come to understand that you can have true joy in God, despite your circumstances. So what do we do with this challenge today? Where do we go from here? Well, if you're on track today, if you look at this list of approach and attention and attitude, and you say, you know what, by God's grace, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm, I'm gaining ground. Then I want to say to you, celebrate that. Man, we're happy for you, and we want to encourage you to continue pursuing what God has for you. But don't quit. You haven't arrived yet. There's still a lot of room to grow. But then maybe you're here today and you say, you know what? I notice a lack. As I look at that list and I think about my approach, it's not what it should be. 
As I look at the things that have my attention, man, they're not always helpful or beneficial in my life. As I look at my attitude and where it is, often it's, well, it needs improvement. If you look at that list and you see a lack, then I want to encourage you today, own it. The first step in in seeing progress is to own that lack and say, you know what, I'm not going to consider this a defeat. I'm going to consider this an opportunity to grow into the purpose for my existence, why God has me here on planet Earth, to bring glory to Him. I want to encourage you to surround yourself with those in your life that can speak truth into your life. That's probably going to mean getting into a community group if you're not in one yet. If you've never experienced community group here at Northridge, I hope you'll join one of our summer groups. Some of them have already started. Some are yet to come, but express interest. You can do that by going to iwant.info on any device and clicking on the button that says, I want to take a next step. Maybe you are in a community group. Man, I want to encourage you to lean into those relationships so that you can be surrounding yourself with the right kind of influences in your life because there's a lot at stake here. We only get one time around. This is only one life that we have to offer up to glorify God, and it exists for a single purpose, and that is to bring him glory. And so to that end, may we commit